Good afternoon. How are you doing? This is Spirit Journey and today is Tuesday, April 18th, 2017 and it's about 1.30 in the afternoon. Well, today is the big day that I discuss the book I read on Santeria. Okay, it was about two weeks ago that I announced that I would be reading this book and that I'll be making notes and discussing what I read about the book. But again, I have to preface that what I'm going to say today is not a critique on the book per se, but it's about the information. Like I bought a whole slew of books and these books I got is to get knowledge, to learn what's going on in the world around me. And so this is one of a whole slew of books and so the information that I gathered from it I'm to you know I'm internalizing what it means to me and the thoughts that I had about it so it's not about the people who practice this religion or tradition not in any way and any religion or practice rituals you do that's for your edification for your growth. This video is in no way to attack anyone or this belief system. It's, it's about freedom of your religious choice or your traditions. This faith system belief or tradition has helped a lot of people when they came over from as slaves. So it's you know more power to those people who in, in order to survive or to keep sane, practice this religion, okay? I just wanted to put that out there. But as I said, I wanted to write notes as I went along. So any, any of these books that I read, I want to have a paper, pen, if you need a dictionary, highlighter, you know, so that you have all your stuff needed so that you could really truly engage in any book of any subject. So I wrote questions as I went along. I, I wrote in the back of the book and in these pages here. So I want to go over it with you. Okay, the first thing I wrote, well overall what I have to say about the book. I actually completed the book yesterday morning. I really enjoyed the last chapter of this book. I enjoyed all of it, but that that last chapter really appealed to me. It, it appealed to my heart and I started even thinking as a boy, it was so powerful I thought that maybe I should become an initiate. That, that That's what the first thing I said to myself after I read the last pages and that's how I felt. The author really pulled on my my feelings. Oh, if I didn't show the cover clearly, you know, this is the book. This is the author's name. And again, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but that's, that's who she is. Okay. And she's from Puerto Rico. Yeah, I think she's from Puerto Rico, or at least she was raised there. And usually when I write my notes, I might put like the page number that I'm referring to. And then my thoughts or if I wanted to quote, quote something, you know, I, I know where I got it from. Okay, the first thing I have here, I do not have the page, but I wrote with Shango, okay, that's one of the or Orishas or gods, when he killed self and a storm followed, his followers feared and made him into a god. And I wrote down sainthood was a thought form made. Okay, what I'm referring to here, like the author gave like a, a general history about one of the Orishas slash gods, how they came about, you know, that what are their beginnings and that he he got killed and the people of that community had fear and they prayed to him and had expectations and so my reading something like this for the first time I heard of the concept of thought forms again I don't fully understand what that means thought form but my understanding was that 
you, let's say, in this case, you had someone, it could be anyone, it could be a, a parent or a friend, and, but it had, and the person or thing had an impact on that individual or society. And so, by keep on appealing to that person, even though they had transition, that it becomes a power, or what they call a thought form, and it becomes a, a living entity of itself. So that's what I was asking myself when I read that, was a thought form created? And if it could be created, then a lot of other things could be created out there that can become a power unto itself, and it perpetuates when you feed it, when you give it attention. Okay, that, so that's what came to my mind. On page 227, my note says, The Orishas are God and represents the Godhead and requires strict obedience. So, people are not truly free agents but slaves, I thought. I also question leaders who use them for power over others. So, what about goodness? They are rewarded only when they give offerings to the Orishas, even if the followers are bad. So here I'm talking about, a, you know, what's good and bad, and that someone could use the Orishas, and they may not have good intent. But again, when I wrote this, and followed after this, you know, chapters later, that the Orishas, or those who are initiated into the Orishas, that there's a strict code of conduct and that you can get punished by the Orishas if you do a no-no. But I thought it was interesting on that page, two, page 227, some of the thoughts that I had when I read about what some of the leaders were doing. You know, not the leaders of the religion, but people of power who tap into Santeria and that some of them were so-called bad. I said, well, what about the good people, you know? On page 228, I write, it seems that the people are programmed into personality traits that represents one of the Orishas. I guess it's like having its last name for belonging. Okay, so what I mean there that someone could be initiated into one of the Orishas, and I thought like when that happens, there's some type of linking and that it's about belonging to that person, someone who's an initiate versus someone who's not. What is the difference between the two? So I thought it was almost like a last name. So anywhere you go, let's say I go to work and you, know, you have to sign your name, they're going to see your last name. Oh, are you related to so-and-so? So it's about belonging to or a family or owning. On page 236, I write, the event of the lady forgetting the ritual reminds me of the ancient Hebrews being punished for not following the offering required of them. Why does the Orisha need the offering on certain days of the week? Can the Orishas get food from the Godhead? Okay, and in, on that page, the author gives a story about a woman who, I think it was a woman, it was some person, and they didn't follow exactly. They, there was a problem with protocol, and there was a, a problem with that, and there was something bad that happened. And I remember about reading in the Bible years ago that with the ancient Hebrews, they had to do a lot of offerings. And if they didn't do something correctly, for example, someone had touched the ark, they thought they were helping because it was toppling over. But that person died because they touched, they didn't follow protocol. So some things you might think was good, that they had good intent, but good intent is not enough that there are certain protocols, rules, and steps 
and if you miss it, regardless what your intention was, it can have bad consequences. So I was just linking two stories together. I hear also, let's see, natural elements, dead or alive, have power to use for oil. So I thought that was interesting. And this is also what, like the necklace that I made, I, I discussed about it a couple of weeks back, that like these, the amber represents things and the coral, the red coral, the, the quartz, that they represent, for me, since I'm the, the designer of this, the elements is earth, wind, fire, and water. You know, these, these stones, you know, the blue represents the water, the brown is the earth, the red is the fire, and this crystal is the air. And so for me, I was learning that everything and things are symbolic too of other things that it in itself has a power. So my wearing something like this is to remind me, hey, let me focus on the elements and the power that it has and help me connect with it rather than against it for my understanding. So that was interesting. I wrote here that God such as Sambia taught people magic. Okay, I wrote that's on page 241 I, I have here. If things have power, I have power because I'm saying that I'm part of things. So if I, if I have substance, you know, matter, then this innate power in it. So I think that's powerful to be reminded about that so that you have power. We have to learn how to tap into that power. And next right here, how could the, the dead or objects have power metaphysically? Hey, that's just a question. During the time of slavery in the Caribbean, how were they able to conceal its practice? Its practice referring to Santeria. Were the practitioners a tool hired by the slave masters against the slaves? I ask this question because slavery lasted so long and did not free the people. So what I'm saying there is, here you have this tradition that's practiced in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean has a very heavy African population due to the importation by force to the people of West Africa and Central Africa primarily. And so if you have this belief system, this uh, traditional religion, and the people are slaves for hundreds, hundreds of years. So I was, I, I threw out the question to myself, were the practitioners, the priests or whatever, were they hired by the people who, who purchased them as a means to control them so they can be enslaved. I mean, I just threw it out there. It was just a question that I have. You know, you have a powerful system like Santeria, but you have people who are slaves. So was it used initially to oppress the people who later on got their freedom and who used Santeria, or what? Where does Sambia go when it leaves? Is this the Anunnaki? the controllers over mankind. Okay, so I'm asking here, okay, they mentioned the, the name of one of the gods, Sambia. And when it's about, where, where does it go? When, when it leaves you, where is it staying? And I was wondering whether that there's a, a correlation between Sambia, meaning gods, and the Anunnaki. And are they the controllers over mankind. It's either you practice the religion or not, you know, they're there. And whether you want to follow them, they still control over humanity. So that's what I was asking there. The next thing I write, we are energy and speaking is energy and can communicate with other energy. These practitioners call slash communicate with these beings slash spirits. These spirits control our world and the material world has energy in them to communicate with them far away. So there, I guess, some of these things, I don't remember even writing. So that's what's important about writing down things as they come to you when you read a book. I'm questioning about the metaphysics of things and this energy 
has information and this information can be communicated with us. And I was wondering how that works. So whether you're far or you're away, it's, it's, it's still, it doesn't matter. Distance doesn't matter. I think that's what I'm getting at. The objects of power are charged slash programmed to do things taught by these gods. Think of it as a VR game, VR is virtual reality game, and you program a hotkey to perform a task. Okay, see I'm new with what they call the virtual reality games. I have a computer and that certain keys on your computer, you could program it and you say, okay, this key's gonna mean this, and then you do something on it, and so it's a link. So you press that key or a series of keys, the computer does a specific thing. So I'm wondering whether when you pray to Orishas, oh, sorry, that's my computer behind. So when you do a ritual or, you know, is that like a hot key? Is it that when you say certain prayers or incantations is this like programming and so when you do the program so to speak it's creating a hot key meaning a, a program key so when you press it it does it for you next I write remember the people of the Indian Ocean gods versus men this is what happened to us I put that in asterisk <laughs> yes I was reminded about the concept of what is God, who is God. It was maybe two years ago, going on two years, that I saw a video on YouTube and it was about a particular group of people who live in the Indian Ocean. This is a phenotypically black looking people. They're, they're one of the darkest people on this planet. They're tiny and now they're under the so-called jurisdiction over India. India acquired the island from Britain, Great Britain. And during the war, you had in the Indian Ocean and other parts of the Pacific, you had so-called Westerners, Europeans and uh, Americans going over to these places. And these people never saw people outside of their group. They landed planes and there was some type of communication. The Westerners, the military people, did leave stuff behind, things for them to eat. And it turned out some years later, some people were curious about this group of people on these islands. And it turned out when they went to visit that these people, in a sense, what we would what many of us would consider worship. They build model things that look like model planes in remembrance of these people from far away who came and visited them and other things. So in their eyes, these Westerners were like a god to them. And I'm thinking that that's what happened to the bulk of the world, that you had someone who visited Europe or the Middle East or parts of Africa who whose technology was just more advanced than them, than theirs, but they're not God. They're not, they're people who can die. They're not, they're not, they're not eternal. So that's what I was writing there. My next thing I write, live audiences on TV are the power source, like movie theater, to enhance the power. Who's taking the power? I started thinking that the, with Santeria, the Orishas have to be fed. And I'm slowly starting to believe, even before I read this book, that there's correlations out there, correlations about what you do and that there's always an, some type of exchange. We have people that gather, like in churches, and then you know in churches you have to give money, or you have to give a lot of uh, singing and music, and all that is energy, and this energy can be used to feed that thing, whether it's God or the Orishas, and they feed on this, and they grow, and they get stronger, and they're able to influence you more. Next are right, Toto equals Earth. Then I wrote here, remember the Wizard of Oz. Toto was the little dog who pulls the curtain to expose the wizard. These movies, they use the word Toto. 
and it said total means earth and then it clicked a memory regarding the movie the wizard of oz and so I was wondering whether there was a correlation. Like, it seems like with certain traditions, religions, they have their own lingo, their own uh, vocabulary. And some of these words sound very similar to other belief systems. And so when I heard the word, you know, saw the word toto, or toto, you know, that the Wizard of Oz. And they're saying toto means earth. And so that little dog... Remember in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, as I'm saying, it was the dog that pulled the curtain back so that you can see the wizard. And the wizard was not God. That wizard was a man. He was a little short, little wimpy looking guy. But he came across like he was a big person. So he wasn't. He wasn't any big person. So I'm wondering whether this thing also, whether Mother Earth, because the book talked about Toto, and that I was wondering whether this total or Mother Earth is also trying to protect us. Then I write down, these movies give info to insiders to protect and, in and instruct what will happen in the future. Wow. Yeah, that's what I think. Even movies like Wizard of Oz. And the last thing I write here, Everything is energy and everything is interconnected. Yes, just like these movies, some of this, the religious practices, they're all interconnected, I, I realized. Okay, I wrote here that the Orishas are assigned foods, numbers, colors, beads, so the beads are all color. And I wrote that, oops, I'm gonna let that go and that the meaning of these is equivalent to frequencies. Everything about life is about frequencies. And I'm thinking that the, these frequencies, if you, you could, if you can reproduce those frequencies, then you're able to tap into these beings or wishes. I also write here, based on page 257, I write, when an offering is given to an Orisha, there is an indication if the offering is accepted. And that this reminds me of the Old Testament sacrifices. I, I think I already may mention about that, that there's protocols and in the Old Testament they had the ancient Hebrews had to do sacrifices and same as in Santeria, that there's offerings that are given. I also write here, some of the rituals is to cleanse. I notice in pop culture that cleansing is so prominent. Why is such an emphasis these days about cleansing? Why the increased awareness about cleansing? What is going on? Don't you know any spirituality thing they, that you put this on for cleansing and uh, everything? So why? Why are we getting dirty? What is happening? The next thing I have here, based on page 268, I write, are the seven African powers, are powers of only Africa and nowhere else? What are their domain of control? Okay, if you have, because they're saying that they are African spirits. Is it that their domain is only in continental Africa or is it something where the the gene pool of those people from Africa where they reside and so is it by domain and they cannot cross into other domains or is it that they're they're worldwide and that they just call different names based on where certain ethnic groups come from, you know? So it's, a, it's the same name, the same guy, the same Orisha, but maybe in a, a different society, they may call those Orishas by another name. And with these powers, are these powers universal? And I meaning, do, do they have the same type of effect? In different regions and that possibly these seven African powers are these other gods 
according to what system they're the same gods or powers but they just have different names according to the belief system of the people of the region that's what I wanted to know I have here on page 268 of the book I write that you need to be baptized first as a Catholic according to the book to get initiated into Santeria I write down why the fact that you have to be initiated first as a Catholic for Santeria that maybe who really controls Santeria is the Catholic Church like a parent and child you need permission so that's that's really something page 276 I write spiritism in brackets I wrote espiritismo spiritism or espiritismo the people who practice that they forsake materialism and they want to come closer to God. Why I wrote that down is because it was reminiscent of me that when I started on this spirit journey that the idea of materialism and that I felt the need to come closer to the truth or Godhood and that I was leaving that behind or wasn't as an emphasis in my life. So there's a term for what was happening to me on this journey and some people call it spiritism or espiritismo. Okay, so that's why I wrote that. I was really excited. I said, wow, that's what it's called. Page 280, all these thought forms that were created. The spirit guides of the mammies, gypsies, pirates, and Africans. They are designed to shape your beliefs, I write it as a question. In the future, you may get the Silicon Valley nerd and drug dealer types. Oh, <laughs> okay, what I'm saying there. See, again, I, I'm just writing my thoughts down as I read. I'm reading from my notes here. Well, what I meant there, based on page 280 of the author's book, was that Okay, you have, the, on that page, the author writes about different archetypes or personality types. And some of these were mammy. In the United States, it would be equivalent to Aunt Jemima. And then gypsies, pirates, and African archetypes. So, those are archetypes that's used in Santeria. So, my thought was, down the road, if religious traditions and beliefs are passed on from generation to generation and it's constantly evolving, so my thought was, okay, what about two generations from now? You have people who had ancestors. Today's people are tomorrow's ancestors that are going to be prayed to or whatever. And so... I was thinking because now things are becoming so technical so I was thinking about Silicon Valley Let, let's say you have someone 50 years from now 100 years from now who are they going to be praying to regarding this technology well you have the Silicon Valley nerd or let's say someone who let's say is a drug dealer and they're going to pray to an archetype of the so-called drug dealer type you know and each of these have a totally different personality to each other the, the Silicon Valley nerd versus the drug dealer <laughs> right so so that that's a good question and again as I'm learning here that these Orishas were formed by people when they went because the, some of them they were actual people according to the legend and something happened when they had transpired and that the people gave it power now on page 283 come on, let's get down okay my little lily come on let's get down i'm sorry guys yeah it's okay baby okay on page 283 i wrote respect and i wrote an exclamation point respect who brought in the paraphernalia 
needs, which were the African American and the West Indian. I feel Africanness is being forgotten and is becoming Europeanized by calling it Latin. And it's not Latin, but African or African Caribbean. Okay, what I was referring to here on that page, that the author, I, I was very excited in a happy way when the, the author of the book discussed how did what they call the botanicas get started. They're very popular in New York City in neighborhoods where a lot of Spanish spoken. But as she mentioned, that it was in Manhattan on the east side around, what was that, 116th Street? And you had, during that time, it was in the 19, I think, this, I think she said 1920, or even 1940, I forget now, but it was, er, it was early. And you had, during this time, a large migration of people from the Southeast, black people, who lived in the southeast were now moving up. Uh, and then you had also a large Caribbean migration also here. Now, Manhattan Island is a place where many migrants moved to, but in particular, you had a large Caribbean population and a lot of people from the south. In Manhattan, you had the subway system being made, and so they needed labor. And I think they used the people from the West Indies, or they were encouraging their migration to Manhattan to help build the subway system that we have now. So people from the South, the blacks from the South were now in Manhattan, and the people from the West Indies, they had certain traditions and the, the, the herbs. and different concoctions. And so because they were away from their prior homes, now they're in the big city and they wanted things for their needs. And so this person had a drugstore or he worked at the drugstore and the people would come to him and say, hey, you know, we have these needs. And do you have, could you get this and that? And so he used it as an opportunity. I think he's from Guatemala. He was from Central America. And he branched out and he formed his own business. And the people were using it. And then by the 1950s in Manhattan, you had a large influx now of people from Puerto Rico. And that they, because they speak Spanish and the name of his shop, it was a the, the West Indian a botanical something. And so they, it was hard for them to pronounce all that, so they just called it Botanica. <laughs> so a lot of these places now, they call it a, a Latin shop, but it's nothing Latin about it. That the needs and the traditions is an African thing. And so I thought that it wasn't respecting where it came from. I, I, I thought when I read it, the information what I read was that the, the paraphernalia or what we know as the botanicas is being Latinized and in brackets, I, I call that Europeanized, and it's pulling away the Africanness of something what it started. It started with those communities, African Americans and West Indians. And they, they were, you know, English speaking people and not Spanish speaking, but it's it's all African. Maybe people who don't speak Spanish will not feel welcome in these stores because now it's dominated by people who speak Spanish. And But yet, who started the whole thing in New York City were English speaking black people. So it doesn't, for me, I'm, it's, it's not language, it's, it's heritage that Blacks and the Americas speak many different languages because who were the oppressors over us? But the common denominator is where we came from, and we came from Africa. And I, and I felt that the Africanness was being taken away and made it into something ethnic of a, of a newer input into New York City 
and it was forgetting who started the whole need and the, the whole the whole lure of it. So that that's where what I meant. Okay, on page two ninety three, when I was reading the book, the author was making mention about that there's a town in Puerto Rico, and it's called Louisa Aldea, A L D S and David E S and Edward A S and Apple, and that that is a black township in Puerto Rico, and I guess what that means is the people are visibly uh, darker skinned people and not like the general population that we see here in New York City that's generally cream color or tan complexion. So and that they think identify with their Africanness too. So I would love to go visit there actually. And that's why I put it down there because I wanted to remember that. On page three oh three I write teachers not to let your body tell you what to do. Self control. This lesson was taught to the little child. Okay, little child. Yes, on page three hundred three. This time, this part of the book, the author is talking about her childhood, and she had what we call a nanny, uh, so, someone who takes care of the children. It's not, it's not a relative, but basically, it's some, it's a, a woman who takes care of someone else's child. They dress them, feed them, you know, everything. And this nanny was a dark-skinned black woman from Puerto Rico, and she initiates the author when she was a little girl. She was five years old at the time. Okay, the little girl, they had left the house. They had to go to a beach. Now, the little girl wasn't sure what was going to happen. The nanny does a ritual over her for her protection. And, but before she does it, at one point she was hungry. Her stomach was growling and everything. And so the lesson was that don't fall into what your body tells you what to do. Whether you okay, if your stomach's growling, it's growling. But you master over your body. And she was trying to teach her self-control because the little girl also at that time, okay, being a little girl, she, she wants to her way, her own way maybe at times and the nanny is trying to teach her self-control and that was powerful so just because certain things in your body are telling you do this you don't have to yield to it at that moment. Page 304 there was the drowning death of this boy and the body was found when an orphan was given to the sea Okay, the, the nanny, her name was Maria, the nanny. Maria, the nanny, told the girl that, that life and death were illusions to teach us to be better, you know, better people. And I thought that was also very powerful to, to say that. In, yes, in that part of the book, the author is recounting a story that a woman was on vacation with a child or something. And... The child was a you know a swimmer, but you know the waves overtook him. Unfortunately, he drowns, and there was a rescue party sent out, and they could not find the body. This uh, parent of the little boy who died had the belief system with the Orishas, and she she said, "Look." Um, I'm, I'm sure if you do this, I, I, I really feel very strongly that the body will be recovered if we do this. So she brought four candles, white candles. She told them, okay, I want to drop them at this spot here. And so they, they were humoring her. They felt badly for the lady, and they don't know about her tradition. And so she does it. And I think she gave a little prayer or something. She threw in the four candles, and then the body came up right away. And they were, the boy was able to get a proper burial. And that was a very powerful story. But I thought it was even more amazing in, in my spiritual walk now that I'm hearing the same thing, that life and death were illusions or are illusions. And this is what she's teaching the little girl, the author, who was a little girl at the time, that life and death is an illusion. And we have to be better people. 
unreal, unreal, amazing. That's an amazing teacher. Okay, this is the last page I have. On page 312, okay, Maria, which is the nanny, was teaching about Yemaya and that the Yemaya represents all human colors and not being white. I realized again that black people were assigned a code and not a representation of our color. It is a frequency. Okay, there were two things going there when I wrote that. Maria is trying to educate the girl. Maria had just done a ceremony of protection over the girl because the girl is five years old and she'll be going to school shortly. Nanny slash Maria wants the little girl to be protected. So the she was teaching where the religion came from and that it came from Africa and that one of her ancestors actually came from the Yoruba tribe and that white people had done her harm but she learned how to protect herself. So the little girl who identifies as being white says, well, I'm white, and she was a little, felt a little embarrassed, you know. But I realized that w with the terms white and black, and I mentioned this in past videos, okay, the little girl identifies with that label, and that label is a frequency, and black also is a frequency too, but it has nothing to do with color. That's what I'm meaning. What I'm meaning there, because you have many people on this planet who have color, who are dark-skinned people, but they're not called black people. So how are you going to distinguish if people? You can even have a so-called light-skinned black. How is that that person being a fair-skinned person, but they're classified as black? Yet you have a dark-skinned person and they might be classified as something else, white even. So I learned there that we are assigned frequencies or codes and it serves as a boundary to keep us from entering other boundaries. So it's a means of control. It's almost like a chain around your neck. It's to keep you posted at a certain location. Author said that she was white and felt that Maria was including her in that the whites were bad. The author did not disclose her black heritage and seemed, like many people from Puerto Rico, unaware of their black slave heritage and that they are free whites. They are still, still in poverty in uh, Puerto Rico and in New York City. This is the illusion of inclusion, system of control exists. YouTube and Facebook. Okay, what I was writing there, I, I guess I was pretty much was making note of it earlier. When I make mention about the little girl who's five years old and she identifies with being white, that I felt that many people from this area, from, from the Spanish-speaking community, they have a different way of classifying themselves than in the United States or any English-speaking country in the Americas. And I felt almost like the little girl seemed unaware. Again, I don't know the author, and maybe she, she's straight European, but in the Caribbean it's, it's very difficult for that. You can be very fair complexion, but you have a black skin grandmother. But I felt in my experience with people from the Spanish speaking world in the Americas that there is almost like a blindfold over their eyes. They may eat foods of Africa or cooked in Afro Caribbean style, but yet deny that they are from that heritage and that yes many of them may be fair complected or even straight hair but it seemed like that even with having a religion like Santeria and but they they deny that that's what they come from and I thought that was problematic it's like yes I I have all these attributes of Africa and yes I I've 
been in slave slavery longer than most of the other people from the Americas, but I'm not African. So I thought that was problematic. So I was writing there that it's an illusion of inclusion, that you have people from the Spanish-speaking world, from the Caribbean in particular, and that they may feel because that in their culture they call or classify themselves as white, they may feel that they're included in the general white community, but they're not, and that many of them are living in poverty. In New York City, the most poverty-stricken area is the South Bronx, where over half, about 60-something percent of the people are on public assistance. And I learned of that statistics when I was in my master's program in nutrition, and we had a research diff about different ethnic groups, because you have to service different types of communities. So you have to know who is living in those communities and what is the nutrition status or so the economic status. Because if you don't have money, it's going to be more of a challenge to get fresh food. So I thought that was very interesting. So the illusion of inclusion that regardless what we what you call yourself, you can call yourself white or European or Hispanic, but that doesn't change your bank book, that you're still in poverty. So the illusion of inclusion. So yes, we're allowing you to call yourself Caucasian or white, but we don't include you. We're not going to have you in the boardroom. You're going to still be in certain positions of exclusion. Okay, my next point here, how to stop trying to be included and break free of their frequency of control. Yeah, this is just a thought about the illusion of inclusion that some of us try so hard to want to belong and I knew I was one of them. I didn't understand why it existed. I felt a lot of the times it was an invisible barrier. It's something you can't really see it but you feel it or you sense it or you see the aftermath of where people live. You have some places where people live where it's immaculate, where they have a lot of services, and the food might be even less expensive and look better. While in other areas, the food is more expensive and it looks rotten, like a correlation, where the things were rotten were where certain groups live, like people like uh, myself, or Hispanics, um, anybody of the Af African experience in the Americas, whether light or dark, it didn't matter. But it's still poverty. And then other people who are not part of that, whether they're from Asia or Europe, they had a lot of services. Okay, so I want to know how, how to break out of that frequency because I already just discussed that the term white and black are, are codes, are free. It has nothing to do with your appearance. But we are assigned codes, and these codes are powerful and could dictate everything that you get in life. You want a code that's going to work for you. So how you remove the old code and put in a code empowerment? The last things I have here is people like Maria, that's the nanny, and teach white children that they are special. What do they, or people like Maria, teach their own children? Isn't that a good question? And it reminds me of the movie The Help that came out a couple of years ago. You had a, a nanny, a dark-skinned black woman, and she is emotionally attached to this little girl and teaching her, the little girl, how special she is. And I questioned myself, if she had a child, does she tell her children or her nieces or nephews that they're special and this and that and people like Maria? Does she do the same for her children? How does she get her children out of poverty? And my last thing I have here is how to use the Orishas to end your oppression from this system. That's the last thing I wrote. And what could I say about it? Could you have a system that is particular, that 
there are procedures and steps. You have to have a, an altar, offerings, and then sometimes some of the rituals are done in a like a service, you know, with groups of people who are invited or maybe they have a membership or something. And there's certain things that are done, music and offerings. So how could people who use this and again when I when I finished reading that book yesterday morning I was very excited and I and I felt like wow is this the, something that I should pursue should I become an initiate because sometimes I feel vulnerable but you know I part of me is saying that I've come this far everybody's always going to be needing help I don't think that I'm to do this, but I respect those who do, who do become initiates. Anything that is going to empower you, do it. But I, I'm still in the seeking information. And with, with Santeria or any type of tradition, you know, it's like, what would you do if you never had a Bible? Does that mean that God doesn't exist? No. So I'm saying, go beyond the pages of a book you're on a, a a deserted island and you're the only one there what are you going to do the the god god is still going to exist so that's where i'm coming from that that as if i'm i'm brand new just come out into this world and what to do to navigate in this system so i'm coming from that angle how do i navigate how do I excel? So that's all that I have to say regarding the book on Santeria. I thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process of going through the book. I think I learned a lot. It opened up new questions to think about, to explore, and to expand my thinking. Again, I hope I did not offend anybody in this review. If you have any concerns or comments, please feel free to write it below. And you can share my video with friends and family members. You could subscribe to Spirit Journey and you can give me the thumbs up also, I'm going to introduce another book and I'll show you that later on in another video. So take care and enjoy. Bye-bye.